Right, so yeah, yeah, at the beginning of the uh, second part of the intro, I just put this up. And we're returning to this today because we've got a shortened class time. And I just want to show you a very simple part of broadcasting, and that is the idea, in radio at least, of getting a message into a wave. Now, one of the things that uh, I mentioned in that second part was that when we speak, when we tend to speak, we, we, things are going to change. I'll just um, move this out of the road for a moment and go to the screen so I can do some drawing. Uh, what do I want? I want that and that. I did this yesterday. And my pen. All right. Waves are defined in two different ways. One is the size that the wave is generating in amplitude. Right? The other might be related to how often the waves occur in terms of the distance between each wave. And there's a clear difference between those two there and maybe these two here. And that is the relative occurrence of the peaks and troughs of the waves over a time period. So that's referred to as frequency. So two parts of the wave identify the wave. The amplitude, the size of the wave, and the number of times that particular elements, the peaks or the troughs, of the wave past a certain point in a time frame. Now, when you come to look at speech, when we're talking, we talk at different amplitudes and often different frequencies. So a voice pattern will have a particular look to it. Um, and you can go online, have a look at images of voice patterns. There'll be periods of nothing, and there'll be periods of rapid movement and periods of loud and, lo and soft. And so we vary amplitude and frequency. Now the problem is, how do you communicate that over a wireless radio system? And two things are a problem. One is that because it's all over the place, how do you know what you're listening for? What do you tune to? How do you register that a signal is coming in amongst all the other signals that are coming. Our ears are very good at this because we can tune ourselves to hear. We can be in a, con there might be 10 conversations going on in a room or even have some really loud noises going on in the room and you can still make sure that you can pick out what you need to hear from it all. Um, I used to be fascinated, you know, in Sydney we used to drive around in, or oh, didn't used to, it was part of the thing you did, you got into a taxi to get around because, you know, traveling in Sydney is better by taxi or bus or something. But I was always fascinated by the fact that the taxi driver could hear what was going on on the radio and I couldn't hear a word, make any sense of it. It was all But he was able to then just pick the thing up and respond to it. Sometimes you might be traveling with your bus drivers going to and from the school and if you're up the front seat, they'll do the same thing. You just, you're talking away and there's noise kids carrying on in the car, in the thing, you've got headphones on, all sorts of distractions. And here's this guy who can pick out this sound. We can do this. But how do you do it when you're actually sending it to someone else, to a machine? So that's what we're gonna have a look at right now. So we'll just go back to the other screen, back to the computer. Or well, actually it's on uh, the US, it's on uh, HDMI, so I better go there. Search source. All right. And what we're gonna look at is this particular I'm going to give it out to you now and I'll just move that up in a second. So these will be online for the online people and we're going to do a little exercise with this. The top wave is known as the carrier wave and what, what um, I'll move it up so you can see it a little bit better. All right, what we have here is a rough, <laughs> really rough concept of a message, a signal that needs to be, well, it's not, the whole thing is going to be the signal, but this is the information that we want to contain in the signal. Now, it could be voice. 
It, it's meant to look something like a voice pattern. Because it's all over the place, because the frequency changes, because it's a bit weird, it also is difficult to broadcast like that. Now we can do it in air, you know, the air compression waves and stuff, and that's fine. But when we start trying to do this with electromagnetic waves, that's a bit difficult. And to go a long distance, we need to have a lot of energy behind it. So we tend to get a long wave that we can send the message attached to. And we have two sorts of bands that were really the ones that we used first off. The long wave would travel further and carry the messages in, into a larger distribution area, perhaps. So you could have more people hearing it. Um, if you want to go uh, more powerfully, a longer distance, you might go to the short wave bands. And now we've got even further down from the short wave bands into the microwave bands. And so we tend to be sending a lot of information now because we can target microwave better and send it. We've got more power available to us now too. And our reception is better too. We've gotten better at translating smaller signals. Some of those signals are so weak, right? One of the areas in which this really took off was when we got really good at amplifying. Now, in the last one, you guys have weren't here, I talked very briefly about how we use transistors to amplify signals. So we're going back to some of the stuff from year 11 work. Um, we can get so good at that now that we can listen to the heavens. So we can point a radio telescope out into the heavens and pick up things that really wouldn't register on most scales of any sort of measure of power. The amount of energy that is coming from some of those distant constellations is so small that it, like, you know that you've seen some of the radio telescopes, the size of the radio telescopes for the long waves they've got to try and pick up and the amount of energy to, to pick up to just be able to make a signal out of. But we are good at it now. So we don't need to worry about the really long old wave forms. They're still around, they're still used and AM is still being broadcast as we'll see. Now what we're going to do very briefly is show you quickly how how you make those two things into one wave. So here's what I want you to do. If you've got a um, ruler of some sort, if you haven't, grab one of these. All right. If you've got one, get it out. And we're going to do what today would be called sampling, first off. Particularly when we want to digitize, and we'll come back to digitization later. But this is analog. Analog means that it's a continuous line. If we were sending a digital signal, we'd be breaking that up in a different way, and we'll come back and do that later. Now, I should be able to, can't I draw on this over the top of this, can I? Yep. So let's change to a pen. What I want you to do is simply go along the line and put in some intervals, maybe four or five intervals. We don't have to do it really brilliantly first off. It's just the idea. So just break this up into a couple of measurable intervals all the way along. All right. And then I'll just change to a different color so that we can see this slightly differently. Take those intervals and draw, and draw them straight down the page through the the sound wave and down onto the one that's called the broadcast wave. So you have a series of lines. This will actually highlight too how if you don't take enough samples in a digital signal you lose a lot of information that's in between things. And I'll probably just stop at that for the moment because you can continue this on and, and do the rest yourself. Now, we are talking about amplitude, which is the, um, in, in an analog signal, it's the voltage up and down, how, how much voltage is being registered at any point. But I'm going to ask you to deal with this like it's a number, just measuring. So you can see at the very beginning here, both of the signals, both signal and Broadcast the, the sound wave and the, the carrier wave, this is called the carrier wave, are zero. So if I go down to the broadcast wave, I can put in a zero there. Just put a dot where that is. But now look at the next one. I measure up here a certain distance. 
you can just measure it straight off the picture because it's, it's actually just a volume, it's, it's now voltage. And that will have a certain level for each one of you. You've put your lines in different places, so they'll have a different level. Then on the same line, measure where the wave on the sound wave is and add the two together. So that when you come down to the bottom part, I'll just move over here. Should be able to just scroll this straight up. Yep, and so your lines should continue straight down to this one. So that plus that is gonna be slightly higher. Let's um, do that in blue. So it's gonna be higher. The two of them are added together, the one from here and the one from the sine wave. Do the same thing again when you get to this wave. This time it's a negative added to the positive. So you've gone up with the sine wave is still climbing. And you'll find that you'll come down a little bit. And the combination of the two waves, if you go along and keep adding the parts together, you will get a different form and you should probably come back to zero when the wave... So it's going to have a sort of similar pattern to the first one. And then again, probably slightly different because I'm looking at it here. I'm just seeing that there's not much change to that one. And then there's going to be a flat spot. And again here then you'll have a... Because it's on the way up on the top one, it'll go up again and then come down and come down. And may not even come all the way down. The two are being combined together. And if I put in, let's go back and try, actually if I scroll it down, it should probably do the thing you're looking for. You're going to come back down. And the original signal wave, oh, it's not going to go far enough. Yep. I've actually got that moved over a little bit too far. But what I'm doing is I've still got the pattern of the original wave in here somewhere but it's now a combination of two and what I wanted to show you yet or what I did on the the diagram on the screen in the second of the two intro ones was that basically if I now send that blue signal out but I attune my aerial to receive the wave in that length so I'm turning it to that tuning to that, I, my receiver generates a reverse wave to the one that we're looking at. I'm getting a bit crowded on there now, I'll just clear that. So I'm tuning to that wave, but in that wave is the signal buried into it. It's changed, but it's still got that pattern underneath carrying the whole thing. So if I then, my receiver takes the reversed wave. So it's just a wave one half out of phase. So I just repeat the same sine wave, same frequency, amplitude rather, with the same frequency. So I've got the same amplitude, same frequency. Turn it in one phase out. Then when I add those parts to those parts, they cancel each other out. So the total of that line, when I do that, is zero. But what remarkably happens when you do that, well, it's not remarkable, it's just logical, is that that then leaves behind what you started with. Because if you can do the math, you just will do the, just the, the logic of it when you do it. If I add those together, send that, then receive, tune to that, take a out of phase wave, remove the carrier wave, then I come back to the signal. And that's the signal that I then send for, uh, further into the system, into the, the, you know, into the system, into the electronics to be amplified, because it's gonna be very weak, to be amplified and then drive a speaker and I'll hear what the message was, what the original analog 
voice was. Does it make sense? It's all pretty simple, really. In the next couple of weeks, what we'll do again is we'll look again at how you digitize that today. One of the things you're familiar with is the term a modem. You know a modem from internet and you know you have to have a modem plugged in. Uh, we do have another term now called a router. So you might have a wireless router attached to your modem so that the signal coming into the modem gets routed out to the wireless so that you can hear or have your computers separated and not cabled. Right? But the modem is short for modulator demodulator. And the modulator idea is that you get a signal that is digitized and you layer it onto a carrier wave. You send that out and the demodulator takes the carrier wave away and gets back the digitized information, which can then be amplified or whatever you want to do with it, turned into a picture or a signal or information. So essentially that's it. It doesn't seem like it's particularly clever, but it is really hard to get all the stuff together to get this to work. And that's why you, know, you needed to have all that background for information. You had to have uh, James Clerk Maxwell working on his formulas for propagation of waves in electromagnetic fields. You then had to have Hertz who would then go and look at how that could be determined and, and how we might receive or at least register that that's true. So he does experiments to prove that Maxwell's form formulas are working. And then you get people like Marconi and others who start going, well, there's got to be a practical way we can do stuff with this. And how do we do that? And they have to invent the electronics to go with this. Now, at first, the electronics was pretty easy. The really first type of broadcast were just sparks. So if you get an electric arc to jump a spark, it generates a pulse. And that pulse is large enough and with enough um, EMF, enough force, to travel through the air and get to a wire and move the electrons in the wire. And if you've connected something to the end of the wires that allows you to register the current flowing as the electrons move in the wire as a result of the wave passing by, you receive a signal. And as we mentioned in that second part, really it was simply using the Morse ideas and Morse code first off with these ons and offs that allowed, and length of time for the ons and off, that would allow you to send a signal. Sending audio required this sort of understanding of how the wave patterns work. Right? There's a whole bunch of other things I did in that second video too that you all talked about in relation to how you visualise some of these things with cathode ray tubes and such. So, Let's um, leave it at that for the moment, for this particular exercise, and let's have a look at what you come up with and see how close you are to what it might really look like. Okay, well, if you've got something that resembles that, you, you can start to see some of the features. The main thing is that the pattern of the original sine wave is still somewhere in there. And in fact, when you got to that part where there is no sound, the original sound, the original sine wave is actually the only thing being sent. That's the signal strength at that point. So basically, and this is not quite exactly the same, the same way you'll see it in other representations. Because sine waves are actually sometimes drawn as um, waves pulsing, about the center of, so the wave is formed in one half, but it's pulsing in both directions. You'll find there's a mirror sometimes drawn of that signal so that it's drawn in here so that it gets that sort of changing. But what's really important here is that the frequency, the time frame over which the carrier wave occurs has not changed. What is changing is the combined amplitude. So this is AM, amplitude modulation, where you are changing the amplitude. Now that stands to reason then there must be a different way of doing the same thing and the one that's different is frequency modulation. 
And in frequency modulation, you're changing the period over which the waves take place. And so the signal might come through where there's a bunched up section and then a spread out section as we add the two energies together. And the signal is in the change in the frequency. Doing the amplitude modulation is easier to see though, because you're just adding. When you do the frequency one, it's a little bit more difficult to get your head around. Frequency modulation also has other things involved in it. Now, let's just ask a question about how do you send a lot more information on the same carrier wave? One of the things we just did was we took sections through the wave based on a time frame. Now, how accurate the curves will be or how accurate the signal is returned or what you get the signal out of it will be based on how many slices you make, how many times you check or add together. All right, so that's the sample rate. But if I was to say, okay, well, if I'm taking a sample rate of milliseconds, which is just enough for us to, we can fill in the blanks. We know in which direction it's going. So if we don't have all the information, we still know it's heading up because that's the, the bit before and the bit afterwards with the gap. So one way we can get extra information into it, I'll leave it in there, I'll put, put it in red, is to do a secondary sample at a different place of a different wave and add the two together. And as long as I know the time frame over which the first, so I could have a second signal sent, another audio signal that I'm slicing up on the red adding it to the carrier wave, slicing the blue up, adding it to the carrier wave. Now, of course, that means that this signal I'm going to get out of it is going to be a really strange sort of signal. But once I take the carrier wave away, then I can go in and I go, okay, I'm taking samples at certain times. As long as I switch between the times, I can then separate the two tracks on time. That's one way. All right, so that's able to use that would give me a stereo signal or at least two pieces of information. Now when you start thinking about a television broadcast and the sort of information that's attached to that, so all the colors, all the audios, left and right channel, the brightness, the contrast, all the levels that you have to get your image to, the speed at which it's, it's taking place, all that is encoded and placed into a carrier. We're pretty clever. I mean, I can't get my head around doing that. I, I, I get to this point and I go, well, that's pretty clever. But to put more and more information into the same signal by using techniques of either slicing or changing the heights or registering only to a certain level for one set. So another way would be that this gets added to that and we then, once we've got rid of the carrier wave, we subtract the two, two from each other. So that the, we can, as long as we know how to subtract, we can do that that way too. So you sit one piece of information on top of the other. It might be the only one to go ons and offs on tops of things. And I know they're going to occur. But anyway, so all of this stuff is about getting information sent wirelessly. Very clever. All right. Okay, I looked at your things and some of you have done a really good job of that. Get the picture? Now, when you look in the textbooks, you're probably gonna see that they've got them different patterns. You can go online, and have a look at them, there's all, but what you're actually doing is just adding the two together. When you get to the other end, subtract them. It's easy.